It's hard to believe that it's been damn near 20 years since Freddy vs. Jason first made its way into theaters, since we got to see Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees finally battling on the big screen. It's no secret that the two are probably the most iconic villains of the entire horror genre, and for good reason. While Jason butchers camp counselors and teenagers at Camp Crystal Lake, Blairstown, New Jersey, Freddy takes another route, attacking unsuspecting teenagers in their dreams on Elm Street in Springwood, Ohio. Today, for no other reason than feeling like it, we decided to make a list where we combine the two franchises and count them down from worst to best. What's so great about both of these franchises is that everyone has a different favorite. With 20 films combined, there are practically a kajillion different rankings that are possible, so it's highly unlikely to find someone who will rank the films in the same order you do, or as we're about to. So, with the preamble out of the way, let's get this started. <laughs> Number 20. The Nightmare on Elm Street Remake Picture the original classic, The Nightmare on Elm Street. Now picture that film if it were produced by the always over-the-top Michael Bay. Now picture all of the worst possible outcomes of that marriage. Well, you don't have to do that. All you have to do is take an hour or two out of your day and watch this ultra-lame remake slash reboot. On paper, it doesn't sound like a bad idea. The film brings the series back to its horror roots, leaving the horror comedy at the door. And Freddy Krueger is played by Jackie Earl Haley, an Oscar-nominated actor who proved just how creepy he could be as Rorschach in Zack Snyder's Watchmen. How bad could it be? The answer to that question is really bad. Extraordinarily bad. But this scene was pretty awesome. Oh my God! You're bleeding. Number 19. Jason X. For years, the long-awaited Freddy vs. Jason project was stuck in development hell. So for that reason, during the early 2000s, the studio felt that they had to put out a new Friday the 13th film. Any film, apparently to keep the franchise fresh in the minds of fans. And that's how Jason X inevitably came to be. Basic plot. It's 2455 and Jason is loose on a spaceship killing a bunch of brainless, annoying 20-somethings. There are sexy, half-naked holograms who want to smoke pot and have sex. You have a female robot who kicks Jason's ass all over the ship. And you even have horror icon David Cronenberg making an appearance. It's not exactly 2001 A Space Odyssey, but what do you expect? Number 18, Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child. After having survived the previous film, Alice starts to have weird dreams again until she ultimately realizes that Freddy is attempting to be reborn through the dreams of her as yet unborn baby. Now, this movie isn't as terrible as a lot of people claim it to be. However, if you say it's one of the better films of the series, shame on you. The film does get points for its generally darker tone. The dream sequences are more gothic than the previous films of the series with the blue filter lighting technique being utilized in most of the scenes. The dream sequences throw up random images and events, which certainly captures the surrealism of dream logic, but does it make for the most coherent film? See any family resemblance? <laughs> Number 17, Friday the 13th Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan. This is one that stinks. The premise is promising, letting the world's foremost expert on machete wielding and general brutality loose on a city that never sleeps. The possibilities are honestly endless, and rather than choose one, the makers of Jason Takes Manhattan spend most of the runtime on a boat. Yeah, there isn't much New York in this movie, and there are plenty of other negative things one could say, but to end on a positive note, let us all agree that watching Jason literally knock a guy's head off with a single punch is always fun to watch. Number 16, Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge. Freddy's Revenge gets a lot of flack thrown its way that it doesn't really deserve. Many fans look at this sequel as such a weird turn from the original Elm Street and ignoring a lot of the rules that were established previously. With that said, this is indeed a solid enough entry in the Freddy canon. However, it's hard not to admit that the dance scene and the shower scene collectively still make up two of the most cringeworthy moments in the entire Elm Street franchise. Something is trying to get inside my body. Yeah, and she's female and she's waiting for you in the cabana. And you want to sleep with me. Number 15. Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday. If long-term fans of the Friday the 13th saga had anything to say about it, 
The people behind this movie would burn in the same place as its hockey mask star. However, the film admittedly deserves credit for its boldness. This time around, Jason Voorhees' supernatural origins are revealed. Apparently, Jason isn't really the person we thought he was. He's more or less an evil spirit that can be transferred from body to body at will. All in all, Jason goes to hell as sloppy and embraces utter madness, but it's still strangely entertaining. So, uh, why are you going to the camp? Well, now that Jason's dead, we're we, thinking uh, about smoking some dope, having a little premarital sex, and uh, not worry about getting slaughtered. Number 14, Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. If you look at nearly any list ranking Elm Street films, you almost always find this one listed as the worst. However, this just isn't the case. It's actually a lot of fun. It's no longer trying to balance the line between comedy and horror, and instead goes for pure entertainment. We have Freddy playing an NES, we have Johnny Depp making a cameo in a This Is Your Brain on Drugs commercial, and the montage over the end credits is just kick ass. If you can simply look at this film as a tribute to the franchise, then you can find yourself enjoying it quite a bit. Freddy's dead. Number 13, 2009's Friday the 13th. When the Friday the 13th reboot was released, it made a ton of money, but there seemed to be this string of unfounded disapproval for the film. However, we'd argue that this film is one of the more stronger entries of a franchise that completely fell off the tracks years before. Over time, Jason went from a simple, deranged psychopath to a zombie to a parody of himself. However, most horror fans will always remember him for the beast that he was. And that's what makes this remake slash reimagining of Friday the 13th such a success, for the most part. Sure, he runs now, but he's a hawking beast again. There is a bit of added development in the relationship Jason has with his mother, but the story remains the same. He is still taking revenge on sex-crazed teenagers stupid enough to venture to camp on Crystal Lake. It's all familiar stuff, in a good way. Number 12, Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood. While this isn't technically the greatest Friday the 13th film, it could possibly be considered a fan favorite of the series. This was the first time Jason went up against someone who could actually stand their ground, namely a young lady named Tina who has telekinetic powers. It's basically Jason vs. Carrie White. With her powers, Tina strangles Jason with an electrical cord, flings deadly weapons at him, and even sets him on fire. And the best part of all, she actually lives to tell the tale. So, not only does she go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jason Voorhees, but she proves that the greatest horror slasher of all time was no match for her. Another bright spot is Jason's impressively grotesque face, designed and created by the film's director. John Carl Bugler. I killed him. Jason's dead. Number 11, Friday the 13th, A New Beginning. Okay, put your pitchforks down. Yes, we are all well aware of the general consensus of this film. People always seem to have nothing but bad things to say about this fifth entry of the franchise. We can certainly understand why. For one, it doesn't actually feature Jason as the killer. The killer is actually just some guy named Roy who was upset that his son got killed over a candy bar. Point number two, well, what is point number two? Indeed, if you can get beyond the fact that Jason is nowhere to be found, then you might find yourself enjoying this film immensely. The kills are just as impressive as his predecessors. It's actually pretty hilarious. We get the best robot dance ever put to film. It's the last entry of the franchise that was still realistic and didn't feature its killer as an unstoppable killing machine. And on top of it all, it gave us Debbie Sue Voorhees. Enough said. Ooh, baby. Ooh, baby. Ooh, baby. Ooh, baby. Ooh, baby. Hey, baby. Hey, baby. Ooh, Number 10. Baby. Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4, The Dream Master. The Dream Master was the first Elm Street film where Robert Englund as Freddy Krueger got top villain. In other words, Freddy was no longer the man lurking in the shadows. He was front and center. This is also the film where the franchise shed any scariness it still had, focused more on gags and one-liners. After Freddy is brought back to life, via dog urinating fire in a salvage yard, he once again goes on his quest to kill the Elm Street children. After killing off the last of the kids from the previous films, he focuses his attention on a new batch of youngins, including Alice Johnson, a young, bright girl, and frequent daydreamer. The film features imaginative kills, memorable characters, and England, as usual, devours the scenery as Freddy. <laughs> <laughs>
I want to draw some blood. Number nine, Freddy vs. Jason. It took over a decade, longer than that actually, for it to happen. But in 2003, we finally got to see horror's two biggest icons, Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees, duke it out on screen. Prior to the film being released, it felt like a presidential campaign. Who are you going to vote for? In the film, Freddy has become unable to haunt people's dreams as the citizens of Springwood, Ohio have generally forgotten about Freddy with the passage of time. In order to regain his power, Freddy manipulates Jason into resurrecting himself and traveling to Springwood to cause panic and fear, leading to rumors that Freddy has returned. A murderous rivalry ensues. With the amount of excitement leading up to this event, it was next to impossible for the film to meet anyone's expectations. However, that doesn't mean that it wasn't a strong entry for both of the respective franchises. Aside from the final battle, you get the usual dose of sex, violence, and rock and roll. The only letdown is the ending. Spoiler alert, nobody really wins. I mean, come on, get real. You're not even scary. You're not even scary. Number 8, Friday the 13th Part 6, Jason Lives. By the time this sixth entry of the Friday the 13th series came around, the filmmakers were pretty much out of ideas as to how to bring Jason back and kill some more. He had been hit by a car, stabbed, and even taken an axe to the head, and he just kept on coming back. The solution? Well, this is the film where Jason became a certified zombie, literally rising from the dead out of the grave to cause havoc. After a new beginning, it was just nice to have the actual Jason back in the mix, zombie or not. Overall, this is one of the better installments of the series. Like I'd have to go and dig up Jason. Some folks have a strange idea entertaining. Number seven, the original Friday the 13th. This is it, the movie that started it all. The little slasher movie that could. The film about a mother who just couldn't stand the fact that a few camp counselors were making love while her son drowned, so she decided to kill a bunch of teens who had nothing to do with it. Not exactly a masterpiece, but certainly not a waste of time either. This film is basically a starter set for the film buffs who start watching horror films. Friday the 13th may play as a cliche slasher, a story of sex equaling butchery, but it plays so effectively well and is a horror movie that is too important to simply be dismissed. It collects everything appealing about the horror genre and wraps it up neatly in this fantastic package, a true classic in its genre. You're doomed. You're all doomed. Number 6, Friday the 13th Part 2 Many fans remember this film the most for being the debut of Jason Voorhees, or at least the debut of adult Jason Voorhees. It's also memorable because it's the only film where Jason is the killer and he isn't wearing his iconic hockey mask. Instead, he's wearing a homemade sack mask with one eye hole cut out of it, which is far more scary to be honest. Jason proves he can live up to his mother's legacy by mercilessly killing a new group of teenagers in new inventive ways. This is also, by the way, the last time that any sympathy can be felt for anyone dumb enough to go to Camp Crystal Lake. The rest of the sequels are filled with people who deserve to die for being so naive. Number 5, Wes Craven's New Nightmare. Freddy Krueger began as a genuinely frightening character who scared the hell out of everyone. As the movies went on, Freddy lost his edge and looked like a bad stand-up comedian with horrible one-liners. The character seemed dead in the water with the sixth film of the series, but Wes Craven brought him back from his rut and made him someone to fear again. This of course helps prove the theory that a truly great Elm Street movie cannot be made without Craven. When you really look at it, New Nightmare was way ahead of its time. Two years before Wes Craven gave the horror genre a facelift with 1996's Scream, the director released this gem of a movie. As far as the film's plot goes, in a nutshell, Freddy Krueger is a fictional movie villain who invades the real world and haunts the cast and crew responsible for his films. Very meta, quite genius. So Heather, we're approaching the 10th anniversary of this whole Nightmare on Elm Street thing. I mean, the original five very popular sequels. How has all this success affected you personally? Number 4, Friday the 13th Part 3 As classic as the original Friday the 13th is, nobody can really deny that a few of its sequels are far superior. The first film was a surprise hit, the second film tried its best to top it, and it wasn't until the third film that the franchise started to find its swagger. Everybody has their favorite moment, whether it's watching a kid take a machete to the crotch, or the moment where Jason dons his infamous hockey mask for the very first time. 
As far as Fridays goes, you can't go wrong with this film. Third time was indeed the chunk. Is everything alright? Number three, The Dream Warriors. Hands down, the greatest Nightmare on Elm Street sequel, Dream Warriors was like a breath of fresh air after the relatively disappointing Freddy's Revenge. Co-written by original creator Wes Craven, the film follows Freddy as he takes his deadly crusade away from Elm Street to a psychiatric hospital for troubled teens. This movie has so many wonderful qualities, but let's start with the kills. Dream Warriors offers some of the best death scenes of the franchise, from Freddy turning a kid into a human puppet using his own veins and tendons, to Freddy posing as a topless nurse only to reveal his true self. Another thing to point out is the fact that none of the kid characters in this film are annoying. In a horror film such as this, that is a true rarity. When each one of the kids gets killed, you genuinely feel bad about it. You want to see them succeed. Once again, with this being the third entry of the series, the third time was definitely the charm. And then maybe you can make it. Can I ask you something? Certainly. Who gives a f what you think? Number two, Friday the 13th, the final chapter. If Friday the 13th Part 3 is where the franchise first found its swagger, then Part 4 is where it perfected it. The final chapter is like a compilation or a best of of the entire Friday the 13th series. Everything that this type of movie is known for is on full bloody display. It's glorious. The kills are gruesome and come in seemingly endless succession. The female soon to be victims are all buxom, sexy, and have no problem going topless. And the comic relief nerds are actually kind of funny. Hell, even a young Corey Feldman isn't at all grating as the horror movie lover who gets to finish Jason off. If somebody was unfamiliar with Jason and the Friday the 13th films, and you can only play one movie for them, this would be the one. It's everything. Number 1. The Original Nightmare on Elm Street Okay, how did you expect this list to conclude? During the early 80s, the slasher movie market was oversaturated beyond belief. With the success of the original Friday the 13th, we were bombarded with endless knockoffs and horror films that weren't up to the challenge of trying something new. Then came New Line Cinema and Wes Craven to create one of the greatest horror movie villains in the form of the burnt-faced, dream-stalking Freddy Krueger. This was Johnny Depp's first movie, playing Glenn, a standard boyfriend character who has a not-so-standard death getting sucked into his bed and basically turning into a mound of body fluid. Heather Langenkamp as Nancy Thompson is still the quintessential horror movie heroine. She's brave, clever, and actually turns her back on Freddy Krueger and lives to speak about it. It doesn't matter how goofy and silly Freddy would later become, the original Nightmare on Elm Street should still be regarded as one of the greatest horror films ever made, period. Oh, and meanwhile. Meanwhile? Whatever you do, don't fall. Asleep. Okay, so let us have it. You obviously disagree with the rankings, so let us know all about it in the comments section below. Or if you do agree, that's great. Let us know that in the comments section below. Goodbye.